Is it yeah. the Satoshi, yeah. Satoshi Nakamoto? <laughs> Satoshi Nakamoto? You know who it is? I don't know. I don't know. Craig. <laughs> Come on. Welcome to the future of money. Come with us on this journey into the world of Bitcoin, blockchain and crypto projects. You're going to meet the trailblazers. These people have changed my life and they may very well do the same for you. Bitcoin, you've probably heard of it, most people have by now. But what is it and where did it come from? In this interview, we meet Dr. Craig Wright, the man that claims to have invented Bitcoin. I flew to Toronto, 35 hours on a plane. Toronto. Toronto. Eh? Eh? So. Completely funded this myself. This is an independent interview. I had to meet this guy. I had to find out, is he Satoshi? What is he doing now? It's a fascinating interview. It was a, a really fascinating few days. There's more to come, so check this one out and be sure to subscribe to hardforking.com for more. Somebody coming into the space now, what, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is a global ledger and electronic cash. So what I'm trying to do is create a system that acts as a ledger for everything. Now, people say, oh, don't spam the network, whatever else, but the reality is that's how miners get paid. So what I want to see is a single global ledger. Wow. There's a reason for that. That's how we minimize fraud, minimize corruption, etc. Um, I've got a theory uh, that the whole business cycle is actually a fraud cycle. So we have Schumpeterian um, disruption where new industries come. Like in the right. 90s we had the internet and when that occurs regulators, individuals, people don't understand the good and the bad technology. So if we look in the 90s you had distributed networks like MyGo and you had um, petfood.com and all of these sort of BS type want to be um, not real industries that came and said I've got a I've got a domain name I don't have a business give me money mm. and they enabled people to grab new funds and everything like that so there were real businesses there were Googles and Amazons and things like that that actually built up yeah. But the funds went across a lot of bad ones at the same time because people didn't know, they didn't know how to judge real business and new industry mm -hmm. versus fake. And we saw that then with CDS and credit default swaps and uh, new ways of doing home loans and things. So all the bad stuff comes and a new wave of bad and fraud and, and BS <coughs> starts. Yep. And then people figure out how to start regulating and understanding it, and then it all collapses. And we're seeing that with crypto now. All the bad stuff comes at the same time as some good stuff. So things that actually have a real business and uh, aren't just trading digital beanie babies uh, are competing at the same time. So real business and the other, and people have, have no idea how to tell them apart, so they throw money at both. And you have this fraud bubble that is created and eventually that bursts and you get left with the real business. Right. If somebody's looking at our industry, I mean, there's just so much confusion. We've, we've got numerous projects using the, the, the Bitcoin name. Uh, you know, how would you, how would you explain it to my mum? You know, she's, she's like, oh, wow, you're talking, talking to Craig, right? Today he looks like a fascinating character. Um, you know, what's the difference between the, the Bitcoin that she owns a bit of and Bitcoin SV? Well, there is only one Bitcoin in my opinion. It was set in stone. Um, back when I spoke to Mike Hearn, it was 2009, maybe April or something like that. Mm. Um, I told him in emails that there's one global ledger. I said the same thing to Gavin. I said the same thing to people at Lou Matt. Uh, not that everyone listens to me. But, um, the whole concept here is a single global ledger. So you can't have all these different versions and you can't have everything sort of in little side chain type things. Yeah. It's all about one ledger. So imagine what that means. It means we can have one set of um, sort of tracing for everything. So uh, right at the moment, think about all the frauds that happen in goods and services and everything like this. I mean, um, New Zealand and Australia, we have a lot of commodities that get fraudulently sold. So in Tasmania, there's um, high-end salmon and um, crayfish that get sold around the world. And, mm. and they also get sold fakely with cheap salmon from the middle of the Atlantic. Uh, and people, because it looks the same, it doesn't taste the same. 
and there's high-end um, lamb products and things like that from New Zealand. Wow. Um, I went to China and uh, I saw all these New Zealand Ugg boots that were made in China. Um, <laughs> which sort it's of... Australian of a bitch, isn't it? The Ugg boot? Yeah, I know. Yeah. But, um, they're selling these things in, in markets over there and, yeah. and they have nothing to do with either of the countries, uh, but there's no way of really tracing it back easily. So imagine if we could have everything, like uh, a manufacturer can now register yep. on a blockchain. Um, and you'd have, you don't do that by having hundreds of blockchains. Right. I mean, you have one set of books. The way that fraudsters get away with sort of many things, like Bernie Madoff had a set of books for the regulators, for the SEC, a set of books for investors, a set yep. of books for his own people to manage their fraud, a set of books for the family. Mm -hmm. I mean, if he had one set of books, then you take that and it stops all so the So we're going to have one blockchain. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's why it needs to be large. Yeah. I mean, um, the other people want to keep them small because that gives them an, a way of creating lots of pump dump scams. Right. Saying, this is the next big thing. Price goes up, they sell out. Right. And then they move to the next one. If you look at people like CZ and things like that. A good uh, friend of yours, right? Oh, yeah. Great guy. <laughs> Did us a favour. He delisted us so that people can't uh, try and uh, scam short the uh, the thing on his um, on his. Yeah, I mean, look, for me, the, the, this industry, really, the you know the professionalism mm. is extremely questionable. You mean uh, there's some <laughs> No, but that, that's what I want to see. I want to see everything in here so that it is professionalised. So that yeah. So that there's actually some trust in the industry. People run around going. Bitcoin's not about trust, it, it's trustless. How are we going to do that? I mean, for me, it's been, I literally threw my hands in the air about six months ago and stopped writing for a while because it just got to a point where I'm like, God. Because you know, we're I, going I, to be friendly with regulators. Is we're going to bring it in. <laughs> yeah, um, what, 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 what are SV doing to? We're, in the next few months, you're going to see the industry start to be cleaned up. Good. Um, so uh, we're going to work with regulators, we're going to work with law enforcement and what people don't understand is even when you're in a scam coin, um, pump coin or whatever else, yeah. you're leaving a record. So the Correct. great thing about any blockchain is anyone who has a node now has an evidence trail. Yeah. So it's when really Enron, lost on everyone, isn't it? This, exactly. This simple fact. When Enron went down, yeah. the first thing, mean, why Anderson's disappeared was they spent the night deleting files. Right. Shredding documents. Can't do that with the blockchain. Yeah, you can do yours, yeah. but someone else has always got a copy of that evidence. Yeah. That's the difference. That's what no one's getting. Right. It is an undestroyable evidence trail. You mentioned Gavin before. You're talking about Gavin Andreas, obviously. Yeah. Have you right. ever, you've actually met the guy? No, I have. He's, he's a nice guy. Yeah. So, you know, he's on record as saying yes. He mm. firmly uh, knows that you did come up with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. What were you? Detractors, what, what, how are they detracting from this? I mean, you're on record now, you've publicly said, yes, I came up with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are they saying? The, you know, people are, you're taking one of the Bitcoin YouTubers to, to court, Peter McCoy. Oh, uh, they, what, what, what's their evidence for, to refute? Well, they want to say that Satoshi's uh, an anarchist cypherpunk. And that's wrong. That was never the case. So. When I, for instance, um, made the comment, this should be attractive to libertarians, which that little quote is taken out of context with the whole thread, yeah. um, was actually talking to James A. Donald. In that, um, what they also notice, if you look at the beginning of how I described it, and yeah. then how the other cypherpunks uh, responded, mm -hmm. James actually then, to when I said this should be attractive to libertarians, responded, now it's not. Um, and the way I was describing it, he, he's sitting there going, that's not attractive at all. There's all this other stuff. We need to change it and, and do things and basically yeah. add side chains and have everyone running nodes and all the core mentality. Uh, it wasn't actually me saying that. All right. those bits there were uh, responding to James Donald and a few others on the, the list at the time. And um, what no one sort of they say Satoshi must be a cypherpunk because he's sent to this list. What they don't understand is, um, I went to do my um, uh, master's degree in statistics at 
University of Newcastle in Australia in 2005. Yeah. Uh, the reason I chose that university and um, some of the people I learnt from there, uh, there, were some, there were a couple people who were both ex-Digicash. They worked, uh, one of them was the CEO, uh, and they were actually professors at Newcastle Uni at the time. Not many right. people seemed to understand that. So, and they were Australia and like New Zealand, our centre of the world, and the rest of the world thinks nothing important ever happens in Australia. Um, but we actually had in that little university that everyone disses um, sort of a big chunk right. of the original guys from the 90s who um, sort of were behind Mark Twain yeah. and Digicash and all the rest. And when I was talking to um, uh, my supervisors and professors there, uh, when I was asking where do I, who should I talk to to launch this, and uh, if, well, I didn't actually say Bitcoin, but I, mean, I said, who would I talk to in, in doing a monetary system? Um, they pointed out um, a few people who were on these lists and said, this is where you should send it. Send it to the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, foundation list, send it to uh, the, uh, the crypto list, and that's why. Right. What, what sort of other figures were, were involved in, in helping you with, with the, uh, the project initially? Um, I had a lot of help from, from people, but not as sort of a group as people say. Right. Um, Dave Kleiman was my best friend for a long time. Uh, he kept me sane, was the biggest right. thing he ever did. Um, when dealing with a lot of these people, it frustrated me to no end. Right. Um, so Dave was my sounding board and, yeah. and uh, all the rest, and uh, he kept me sane. Um, we had um, Hal Finney was critically important. Yeah. Uh, he came. He never actually even knew who I was. Right. Uh, but um, if it wasn't for him, the code wouldn't be working. So uh, right. people don't realise that the difference and why the Genesis block is on the third of January, and then it's over a week later or so before Bitcoin actually starts as Bitcoin right. was because it kept falling over. Right. <laughs> it was a bug in the code and, and um, uh, Helen and Bear helping um, actually worked on bits of the code to right. find where the error was and why it crashed. And you might guess that if the code keeps crashing then it's not really going to be a blockchain. In the second part of this interview we talked to Craig about a court case involving his best friend and business partner, uh, Dave Kleiman. Dave died in really unfortunate circumstances. He was penniless, uh, it was a very sad story. I asked Craig how it felt to be involved in a court case being sued, effectively sued by, by Dave's family for half the holdings. A court ruling has just come down in the last few days on this saying that he's gonna have to hand over half the Bitcoin he has, along with a lot of IP. This is an ongoing story, we'll uh, continue to follow this, but check out what Craig had to say on the case back in June. After Dave died, his, um, uh, I spent some time trying to track down his father. I didn't really know much about his brother. Dave never spoke about his brother at all. Um, hadn't actually seen, uh, Dave hadn't seen his brother in, in years from what I know. Um, but it was important to me to try and talk to his father and tell him a little bit about what had happened. Um, unfortunately, Ira then comes in um, wanting a lot of money and wow. being greedy. Uh, part of why I contacted them was I made a promise today um, that was actually about a week before he died. I'd um, sort of given him shares in a one of the companies I was founding, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, would have helped him a lot. He needed the money and uh, all the rest. And um, uh, I think it was literally a, a week or something before he died that all that was finalised and rolled in. Wow. So yeah, it's got to be a bit heartbreaking having to go through this process now mm. with, with the situation. Mm. Yeah. So moving forward, um, where will we be in, in a year, five years with with your project, I mean, it's... A year will, you, how would you describe it? Are we, you, you're creating a, a new internet, effectively? In a way, I mean, yeah, we hope to replace the current it. One, or is it something um, that would run on parallel? Uh, I hope to consume the internet. Right. The problem with the internet is it's really a flawed model. 
I mean, if you look at Google, um, they base sort of searches on popularity, not value. Uh, because popularity gets them more hits and more advertising. So the reality is we have a model that is all about popularity. And what's popular isn't good. I mean, that, that's a thing people have to understand. Just because lots of people like it doesn't mean it's the best thing. Just because lots of people vote for something on, and make it the most popular article in Wikipedia doesn't mean it's right. So there are many things that are eh, sort of okay, but wow. not, not really good. And there are lots of... I mean, we're trashing everything. We're pointing people to lower and lower trash. We're, it's... I don't know if you've seen the movie Idiocracy. Yes. But um, I mean, that's what we seem to be creating. We're, we're getting the stupider comments yeah. get more votes. Yeah. So we get more stupider comments. So we're evolving stupidity rather than having a cost yeah. to doing things. So I like to think the last thing I want is a community. A community is just a group of people who have no rules. I want a society. And there's a big difference. In society, you have to learn to get along. And trolls get kicked out of society. They can have their community. Wow. <laughs> so I've just been told I've got one more question. Um, <laughs> what's what's a, a question that you would love to be asked that maybe somebody hasn't put up until now? Oh, I don't know. I mean, um, I'd like to say that... Um, us down there in that little island that no one cares about, all of us, New Zealanders, Australians, we punch above our weight. Stop thinking that because we're in the middle of nowhere, I mean, so what? We have per population more Nobel Prize winners than uh, most of the rest of the world. I mean, we have inventions we uh, create. We're not just a place that commodities and sheep and whatever else come from. Um, I know the rest of the world thinks that. and. And well, we're not Bitcoin American. comes from there now. That's exactly. <laughs> um, I mean, I remember when I was young, there was a guy I knew, uh, Robert Ells. He was one of the founders of uh, um, what became DNS. He worked at the University of Melbourne. So everyone talks about internet being developed by ARPANET. And, uh, we've got all these protocols being developed in Australia and things, and no one remembers us because, well, Americans used it and took dot com and Anyway, actually, I've got one more question. Okay. The, the, obviously, uh, Bitcoin and, and, and gaming have a, a very mm. close relationship. Can you just tell us a, a wee bit about that, the history? Well, um, the first casino in the world, online casino, that was ever licensed was actually in Australia. That was licensed. Yeah. Was uh, that you? I was involved with that, yes. 1999? Uh, 1999, I know, terrible. I, I was the, um, the guy who got all the tech done and I made yeah. sure that uh, everything passed the audits for the Northern Territory government and we yeah. set up the auditability trials and, and payment systems so that the government took their cut and you name it. Mm. And then I was involved with a number of others after that because being involved with the first and getting it through mm. where Deloitte and everything couldn't um, you know, gave me a, a lot of reputation in the industry. You're a poker player? Uh, can be. Okay. Uh, I'm going to poke you. Let me show you full hand. Is, you know, you're spending a huge amount of Bitcoin. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the time. I've enjoyed it. Cheers. Thank That's you. Great. Cheers. Thanks, everyone. I hope you found that insightful. It was certainly an amazing experience for me. There will definitely be more with, uh, with Craig, with the Bitcoin SV team, some amazing people involved in that project. We're going to be following it closely. So, Subscribe to hardforking.com and you'll be the first to see new content. We're also going to be interviewing some of the, the, the best and brightest in the overall space. We've got some incredible guests coming up. See you soon.